You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means it begins once again. Yes, our broadcast week has commenced here on the Options Insider Radio Network. Welcome back to another week of goodness, fun, education, analysis, information, all of the above interviews, a wide array of products at your disposal, equity options, futures options. We'll get crypto a little bit later. Smattering of other fun shows. We have the advisors option coming at you this week here on the network coming at you Wednesday, I do believe. So stay tuned for that. Everyone in the live stream will be able to get access to that instantly out there. So a lot of fun, of course. If you want to join the live party, two ways to do it. The plus or the pro, the pro easy for me to say. The plus or the pro. <laughs> Head on over to theoptionsider.com. You can go to slash shop or to slash pro. We'll get you to show both of them as well. And you can compare and contrast at your leisure, of course, on demand. On every platform and device on the freaking planet, I think, is the technical term now out there for how many platforms carry this stuff. And I'm not kidding. There are more all the time. I thought we had tapped out of the how many new platforms there could be on the on-demand audio side. And then I check our email every day, and there's three new ones (laughs) looking to carry the stuff. It's amazing how many venues there are out there. So we're pretty much on all of them. So check them out. Listen, read, rate, and review if you like what you hear on your platform of choice. Of course, keep those questions coming in. We do love to hear from all of you guys and gals as well. If you'd like to play along, I know a lot of you missed our questions of the week. They are back over there on the old Twitters. Our question of the week this week, you know, we'll play off our last week one a little bit later in the show. This week, we're asking, hey, straddles. Straddles, kind of a contentious topic. Some people love them. Some people hate them. A simple question this week. Do you guys trade straddles? Gave you three choices. You know how I like to give you a little curveball. We can't just make it straight up. So we said, yes, I love them. No, I hate them. Or I prefer flies slash condors. You can't fit iron flies in there too, or we would have give you a 25 character limit. So we have to assume that you know flies also encompasses iron flies, which is really where the straddle component comes in, right? There's a straddle in the iron fly versus a traditional butterfly, which is a little bit different. Uh, so there you go. That's live. Just went live right before showtime. Get on over there to add options to make your voice heard. And you know, you know, we can't kick off this movable feast known as the Options Insider Radio Network without doing our newest favorite segment. Dare I say it, it's maybe Uncle Mike's favorite time of the week because it is time to name that 80s wrestler. Can you guess that wrestler? Via his entrance music. Here we go. Sling Federation. For over 50 years, the revolutionary force in sports entertainment. Well, I started this dance in my neighborhood. 
now everybody's doing it because it feels so good. All you need is a partner that know how to move, and the rest is real easy. You just dig the groove, and when you get yourself started, it's hard to stop. You just go for your partners, you know what? And then you G R A B T A G F C A K E S. All right. Rare song that actually is performed, I do believe, by by the wrestler himself. I knew later on, I think in his career, this this guy also, I do believe, came out to uh, Queen. The other one bites the dust. But this was we kind of like to go for the WWF early era. And this was definitely the song that he rocked back then. This is another one of these guys. You know, it's not a Hogan. It's not a macho or an Andre or a warrior, those kind of guys, but he's maybe one tier below him. And for a certain period there in the 80s, he was a pretty popular one. I'm pretty sure he was one of the ones featured in the Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, and all the kids knew about this guy as well. So he was he was definitely a name you'll recall, even if his song perhaps doesn't uh, immediately leap to the top of your mind. We are joined, of course, now by the unclest of Mike's, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussar, reigning defending champ out here, even though he's had a little bit of a of a dry spell of late, missing out on Greg the Hammer and a, and a bunch of others. Let's see if he can redeem himself this week. Mr. Uncle Mike Tussauds from St. Charles Wealth Management. First off, A, welcome back to the program, and B, can you name that tune? Dare I say it, sir, can you grab them cakes? <laughs> I'll do what I can. Great, great to be here as always. I will go with the Junkyard Dog. Well done, sir. Climbing back out of that hole. Yeah, he's kind of iconic. Even if you don't really remember his song, you can hear that and it kind of evokes it evokes the junkyard dog, doesn't it? You know that's not Roddy Piper when you hear that, right? <laughs> for sure, for sure. I actually thought that Another One Bites the Dust was his only entrance music. So at first I'm like, no, that couldn't be the junkyard dog because he comes out to Another One Bites the Dust. But I was trying to think of any because he sounded like he was African American. And so I was trying to think of any other African-American wrestlers of that time. And it wasn't slick because he was a manager. And I was thinking, okay, I I was thinking Coco Beware. But then when you said he later came out to Another One Bites the Dust, then I'm thinking, okay, that's got to be the junkyard dog. My secondary clue gave it to you there. Yeah, it's always hard with these guys because some of them had multiple. Like, you're right. I kind of more recall JYD with with the kind of the the queen tomb. But this we want to go back to the the heyday. And in the heyday, in fact, we went out and looked. That's some tape of him coming in back in the early days against King Kong Bundy, and he came out to that song, so we had to go with that one. Now let's go out. I do believe we are joined, fashionably late as always, by the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, by way of Carmen Lion Capital. A, Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program. B, did you hear that song? And C, do you have any enduring memories of JYD, sir? Ah, love JYD. Big fan, and yes, I heard the song and I knew who it was. Uh, big fan of the Junkyard Dog. Now, do you think of him with that song, or do you think of him with the Queen song? I think of him with the Queen song, but uh, I wasn't when I heard the boy. You knew it was him, right? And and he, it was definitely the Junkyard Dog. Yeah, I, I really liked him. Um, he was uh, he was one of my favorite characters on Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. Yeah, he was uh, on that one. Yeah, he was one of the good guys. He was definitely one of the bigger personalities of that crew, uh, and. Uh, I just always thought he gave the best interviews. Um, just really, really, really good with Mean Gene Okerlin. And uh, so, yeah, big fan of, the, of JYD. All big fans of JYD. May he RIP as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block, the portion of the show. We break down what the heck is trading. Yes, the network is more than 80s wrestlers, only slightly more, (laughs) but a little more than 80s wrestlers. And yeah, a lot lighting it up, a lot going on this week in terms of dollars changing hands or potentially changing hands. 
trillions of dollars being decided on this week down there in D.C. Debt ceiling, of course. They're also voting on all those infrastructure and spending bills. So literally trillions of dollars will probably be decided this week. So the markets are kind of in flux going into all that fun. Coming into today's session now, we're seeing uh, S&P off about a quarter of a percent, a little more than that. The Dow up about a third of a percent. And the NASDAQ off about two-thirds of a percent. So kind of a bit of a mixed bag. It depends where you hang your head. What kind of day you're having out there in the market. And VIX was hanging around at 1850. It has ticked up to about 18 and three quarters as we uh, gassed on about good old JYD. That puts it up not quite a half a point, about 0. 0.4 from where it was on Thursday. Show VIX right around a 108. That's actually down two from our show on Thursday. VXX coming into showtime is at about a 25 Puts it down about three quarters of a point. And UBXY was a little bit shy of the 21 handle. Man, threatening a 20. A 20 and three quarters down about one point from this time last Thursday. And Vol Q, the add the money vol, the NASDAQ, obviously ticking up a little bit, given that we have a bit of a strong sell-off off there. Up about two-thirds of a point, right around 18.15, kick off the show. And since he did get it right, we'll go out to Uncle Mike first. Mr. Uncle Mike, first off, if you have any enduring memories of JYD, have at it. And then B, more importantly... What is lighting up your tape out there today, sir? Oh, definite fan of the Junkyard Dog. I remember there was a match, I think it may have been WrestleMania three, to where him and Harley Race had a feud going. And uh, Harley Race was kind of at the end of his career. Uh, and then the Junkyard Dog uh, was taking him on. So I remember that. Um, and I just remember how excited. It, it's funny. I remember how excited the junk. I would get and the crowd would get whenever another one bites the dust would play. So I do not remember that theme music from today, but uh, definitely remember another one bites the dust. How he had, I think he had thump written on the, on the butt of yeah, his tights. Yeah, he had thump. The, the he had the chain. Tights. And apparently he actually sold that record. That was a record that he, they produced with him on it and they actually sold it. Huh. Very interesting. Yeah. I was definitely a fan of him. I remember in the rock and wrestling cartoons, he actually lived in an actual junkyard, so definite fan of the junkyard dog. So anyway, with the market today, it feels like people are spreading out their risk among different spots in that they, it feels like this is kind of a reallocation day in a lot of ways and that um, bonds are down and stocks are down, although not a lot. And I'm referring to the 10-year note, the S&P 500, uh, so, but not a ton. And so... With that, as I say many times, often one of them corrects. You never know which one it's going to be, but that's uh, oftentimes what does eventually happen. Maybe not today, but in the next day or so, it usually does. And so we have the S&P down. Uh, we have the Q's down, but we have the Dow up a little bit. We have silver up a little bit today. And so it just feels to me like this is people wanting to spread out their risk with everything that's happening right now. Like, well, I got a little too much of this. I got a little bit less of this. And it feels like big money is doing that right now going into uh, this week with all of the, as you put it, trillions of dollars that are going to move with uh, the debt ceiling and the, what's going on in Washington. So we have that happening right now. And so ultimately, I think we are in kind of a wait and see market. Uh, until those things happen. Now, if we, I think they're going to expand the debt ceiling. I'd be very surprised if they don't. Uh, I've never, it seems like, oh, are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? Will they, won't they? Well, the Republicans want this. The Democrats want that. Oh, will they, won't they? And then all of a sudden at the 11th hour, magically we've come to a deal. And so, because I don't think anybody doesn't want that much horrible gridlock, but you never know. I could be wrong with that. Politicians are politicians. So we always have to be prepared for anything. So I think ultimately that um, we are waiting to see what that's what's going to happen with it. Uh, and in the meantime, um, I'd prefer to just watch rock and wrestling cartoons than over watching Congress. Well, who wouldn't? Who would rationally choose C-SPAN over Hulk Hogan's rock and wrestling? If you would choose C-SPAN, you have to check your pulse, listeners. And you got to go grab them cakes as we keep on rolling <laughs> out there to the greasiest of meatballs. Mr. Meatball, sir, a weird week, a lot on the docket this week from a policy and agenda perspective. It remains to be seen how that will impact the market. So far, it's a lot of mixed baggage out there. What's line up your tape today, sir? Yeah, well, to Mark's or Mark, to Mike's point, uh, this is an allocation day. And let me tell you what's going on. Yeah, the S&P is down two-tenths of a percent, down about uh, nine points right now. Um, RSP, which is the Equal Weighted S&P ETF, RSP. 
So the difference between this one and the S&P 500 itself is it carries the individual sector ETFs and then rebalances them every quarter based on which one gained the most and which one lost. So it sells its winners and buys its losers. Well, that one is up uh, 0.6%. It's up almost 90 cents. So you've got huge outperformance in RSP, which is holding the same equities just in different weightings as the S&P 500. And that shows you that it's just it's money moving around. Uh, the Russell 2000, which has been uh, the redheaded stepchild of indexes, is up a whopping 37 points right now, up 1.6%. The Dow Jones is up while the S&P is down. And that is a clear sign of this being an allocation day, as Mike says, and really not a big day where a lot of money is coming off the table. Um, the NASDAQ is taking it in the chin while some of the other ETFs are really having strong days. Energy, the energy ETF is up 3.6%. Financials are up 1.3%. Uh, the biotechs are up 1.2%. Materials up uh, 1%. The, the big loser is XLK, uh, down almost 1%. And the pharmaceuticals are down almost 1.5%. So it's uh, just a complete reallocation of dollars. A lot of reallocation going on out there. Let's break it all down. Before we get to that really quickly, a weird, weird debate raging in our live chat right now. <laughs> Not sure where this came from, but uh, Mr. Unlimited asked, if the show was the last dance, would the meatball be Jordan or Phil Jackson or Rodman? And then we have Nichols saying, Longo is clearly Jordan, although I also get a Jackson vibe from him as well. Yeah, you know, I can think I can play a bit in both camps. You know, uh, clearly the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, but also... You know, kind of the intellectual leader of the group. I decide which way we go, that sort of thing. So I could, I could kind of see how you'd come down on both fronts. <laughs> Options Queen saying the meatball is Rodman, definitely. You know, I could also see that. I could see the meatball in a wedding dress in North Korea. So there's a lot, a lot of that. And then Limits, that leaves Tucson actually as Phil Jackson. So uh, interesting. I don't know, Mr. Meatball, since you were invoked, uh, where do you fall on this, the option block as the last dance debate, sir? Oh, I mean, all right. So let's let's and let's all agree straight. you are definitely Rodman. Clearly, let's get this thing straight, folks. All right, uh, Mark Longo is Phil Jackson because he runs the show. All right, um, what he's done is taught me how to pass. I am Michael Jordan because we all know how brilliant I am, and Mike is kind of the rest of the team. Mike is Scotty Pippen. Mike is that, Dennis. Rodman. I definitely get more of a Pippen vibe from him than a Rodman vibe. <laughs> yeah, well, he's not definitely not as eccentric. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm definitely more of a scorer than I am a rebounder. Um, you know, but, so I would absolutely say if anyone is the GOAT of option block, how could it not be one Mark Sebastian? Now, Mr. Uncle Mike, where do you fall in this debate, sir? Oh, my gosh. Um Okay, so as a player, I'll give myself Rodman because I often like doing things that other people don't like to do, and he liked to make his career as a rebounder, and uh, he 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 did the he was a he was a great defensive player, and that's definitely is my personality, both in business and uh, as a football player, I was an offensive lineman doing the things that other people don't want to do. So as a player, I think I'm definitely Rodman. Um, off the court, though, I don't drink hard liquor. A night of power drinking to me is a second beer. So I don't think I can fit into the Rodman thing off the field and, or off the court. So I don't know if I'm him there. In terms of um, uh, the rest of the team, I think I could be a mix of others with personalities and whatnot. But um, that's probably where I would fall. And I'm going to just leave it to the audience to determine who the GOAT is and who is Jordan and who is Phil Jackson. <laughs> it is funny. Yeah, it's weird because you got personality-wise is different. Personality-wise. I'd say uh, the meatball, definitely Rodman. And I guess I follow a bit of the Jackson way. Role-wise, I certainly do because I have to be the leader out there. Uh, but, you know, I have been known to wear a 23 every now. Actually, I don't, I don't have any Jordan gear. But <laughs> a fun debate to be had outside. Of, so this is why I love our chat. They take us in such weird and wonderful and interesting directions. So you guys can join them over there, theoptionsider.com slash pro. Weigh in. Where do you feel we fall on the last dance spectrum out there speaking of spectrums what kind of day is it out there from a market spectrum out there 
it kind of, once again, it depends where you're looking. Vic's doing a whole heck of a lot of nothing right now. 82,000 contracts on the tape, even though the ADV continues to tick up, closing in on half a million contracts, 476,000. You know, if you listen into ball views or anything, it's been about a month ago, it was almost 100,000 less than that. So we have seen a bit of resurgence, the sell off last week, uh, kind of helping those numbers creep up a little bit. Spy also putting up some numbers, 2.7 million contracts on the tape. The ADV is closing in on 5 million out there right now, 4.9 million in spy land. The S also putting up some numbers, 900, almost a million contracts up in the S right now, 916,000. That's a lot for a big beefy product like the S. Uh, the ADV holding firm right around 1.5 million. The Q is also putting up an M out there today. 1.14 million already on the tape in the Qs. The ADV is about 1.4 million there. And uh, small caps lagging a bit, 346,000. Still more than half of their ADV, though, which is 644,000 out there today. In terms of most active single names, it seems like we got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of car and automobile oriented names dominating our top 10 today. By the way, cost you 214,000 contracts to break into the top 10 today. That gets you to Bank of America. Unfortunately, the other half of the symbol twinology on the B side anyway, not in there today. Our friends across the street in Boeing, but number 10 gets you to Bank of America, 214,000 contracts. Number nine, Nvidia. You could argue they're maybe driving a lot of what's going on in the automobile sector, they and other chip manufacturers, because there's no chips to be had. But number nine, NVIDIA, 223,000. Number eight, Lucid Motors, back in our top 10 again. Actually, I do believe this is Lucid Group, which is kind of the parent company of all of them. But still, Lucid Motors is what all of you know. Ticker symbol LCID, 225,000 contracts on the tape today. So after not really seeing them in our top 10 Pretty much ever, <laughs> all of a sudden, they're popping up on our radar now twice in the past week and doing some decent paper to boot. Number seven, one half of our other A-oriented symbol twinology, to coin a phrase, it's AMC, only 228,000 contracts. That's a pretty light day for the reigning meme king out there right now. Number six, Amazon, with 230,000. We're at number six, right, listeners, and we're still not even at a quarter of a million contracts. So kind of a weird day. Again, it's, it's a strange day out there. You know, it depends where you look at how much paper is going up. Number five is Palantir having a pretty robust day. Finally getting us over 300K, 310,000 contracts on the tape for Palantir today. By the way, Lucid Motors is up about 2.6%, trading right around $26. Let's see where Palantir is hanging out right now. A little bit north of 27, about 27 and a third. Off about one and a quarter points, about almost four and a half percent today. So give them back a little bit of what it has gotten over the course of the past week or so. Got up to about 29 pretty much exactly over the course of the last week and giving some of that back up now number four the other half of the a oriented symbol twinology we got amc and you can't hard press to find a day where amc and amd aren't hanging out in the top 10 together this time it's amd taking the crown number four 417 thousand contracts what is outpacing it to the upside by 1000 contracts you might ask well it's ford Good old formerly sleepy Ford. Ford has these fits and starts, which are interesting to watch. Ford is popping off today, and I'm not sure what is driving it. It's up about half a buck or about three and a quarter percent, trading right around 14 and a quarter. Uh, the only news I can see is that they're recalling Mustang mach <laughs> for windshield issues. I'm not sure why that would drive the stock. Maybe there's a hidden upgrade around there somewhere. I know they had bad news coming out of India lately, and their head of India quit recently. But outside, I'm not sure what is driving this pop today, but... Something is driving this action and putting up some numbers out here in four to the tune of 418,000 contracts on the tape in Ford and good for the number three spot out here on our top 10. Let's look really quickly. Right now, today, oh, it's the OC 14s expiring, not even the monthlies. These are expiring on the week. October 1st, 14 calls, listeners. Already almost 100,000 of these have traded. 93,684 to be precise of the OC 14s on the tape out there, followed by 55,000 of the 14 halves expiring on the 8th and 38,000 of the 14 halves expiring this week. So maybe taking off a vertical and just rolling it out to next week. I'm not sure. I'll have to go digging a little further to see what the hell is actually going up out here. But that's what the most active contracts are out here today, listeners. So someone putting up some numbers in four. Number two, yes, I said number two, it's Apple. 599,000 contracts. And number one this week, yet again, Tesla. On the rampage, up nearly 20 bucks or about 2.5%, trading a little bit shy of the 800 handle, right around 794 right now. 
good for the number one spot and one and a quarter million contracts. That's Apple territory that's hanging out in right now. So Tesla lately hitting another gear. It looks like Tesla doing a nice little smoochy love dance there with China. <laughs> I'm not sure that must be what's driving this. But uh, either way, also talking up their delivery numbers as Musk is wont to do. Maybe that one-two combo enough to drive this. Either way, we're seeing a lot of action out there. Not as much action this week on the earnings front. We still have some names popping off, though. We have Micron after the bell on Tuesday. We have, what else? CarMax on Thursday. And our former, you know, the name we used to mock, Bed Bath & Beyond. Good old BBBY. (laughs) Not that long ago on the network, we had a death poll. What was going to die first, this or GameStop? And then, of course, we all know what happened once 2021 kicked off. A whole other order of magnitude. For GameStop, Bed Bath & Beyond, not quite to that same degree, but they had an interesting run as well. We shall see if that continues here on Thursday. We do have updated earnings move, earnings move results, and earnings season reports. Hot off the presses right before showtime. Check it out for yourselves, theoptionsider.com. Click on the Options News and Articles tab. We got here Micron after the bell tomorrow. They're trading at 74 bucks, pretty much exactly. They were pricing in 387 In the past, they've moved about 481 so they've taken a buck. Pretty much off of that straddle already, which again, given what we've seen on most of this of the cycles so far, that's hard to argue. That's not the right play. Uh, Bed Bath and Beyond on the thirtieth before the bell, they're trading just shy of twenty three bucks when this report came out. They were pricing in two eighty six in the past. They've moved three thirty two. So once again, a little light on the vol, and once again, hard to argue that that is not the correct play. The same day, Carmax on the thirtieth as well. They're trading almost one forty four and a half. They were pricing in $7.50. In the past, they moved about $8.20. So again, $0.70 cents off the top, close to 10%. Hard to argue. That's not the right play out there. And let's look at the season. The season still holding firm at 86% here, listeners. Uh, haven't seen much of a change on the updated earnings season front. As we keep on rolling, it is that time, listeners. Time to grab them cakes and unleash the Eye of Sauron. It is time for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the Odd Block. All right, welcome to the Odd Block, the portion of the show where we get weird, we get wild, we get whimsical. Speaking of whimsical, that debate is still raging in our chat. We have Nichols chiming in saying, long go for goat, all exclamation point. Well, I appreciate the love. I appreciate the sentiment. And again, it kind of depends what lane you're viewing it through, right? Through the options-oriented media and broadcasting? Yeah, I'll take that. Who created options podcasting? That's us here on the network. We wear that flag proudly. So I will take that one. Sure. Thank you. But uh, outside of that, I'll let everyone else argue who should be Jackson, who should be Rodman, even though I do like the notion of uh, the meatball in a wedding dress in North Korea. If someone wants to workshop or Photoshop that image out there on Twitter, I wouldn't hold it against you, as long as you share it with us so we can share it with the world. (laughs) All right, let's get on out to Odd Block land. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron has found for us today, listeners. I'm going to kick things off. With a little bit today, actually, because it's such a weird mixed day, not a ton really blowing our doors off here from uh, a, an excitement perspective. So we're also going to look back because our catalog of weird trades to keep an eye on is just overflowing. Uh, but we're going to kick things off today going out to Dynatrace, ticker symbol DT. Uh, this is not a name that we feature regularly here on the old odd block. This is a this global tech company that provides software intelligence and artificial intelligence and uh, automation. So they uh, it's automation to monitor and optimize app performance. So there you go. All sorts of sexy buzzwords involved in their trading right now. Right around 72 and a third up. Oh, a good year here before we get to that. Off today, off almost two and a quarter percent, right around 160 or so. Uh, so taking a little bit on the chin today after having a nice pop, getting up to about almost 74 bucks just this past week. In fact, it looks like that was the high, 74.34. Just this past week is when they hit it. A year ago, it was trading about 40.82. So it's had a nice run. 
It's been mostly upside, a few sell-offs. You got a little bit of weakness in October last year, traded down to about 35. And that looks like we're a hit. It's a nader for the year, right around 33, 83. Pretty much been mostly up ever since then. Got up to about 56 on February 8th. Then it kind of trended lower again, back down to about 44 and change by May. So I had a kind of a drift of a couple of months toward the downside. Then ever since that nader, second nader, I should really say, on May 13th, it's been pretty much straight up. Uh, topping out last week right around the $74 range. So a nice run here over the course of the last last few months here in Dynatrace. And this looks like, given this kind of upside run, looks like we might be playing in the calls. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron found out here today. Yes, that is the case. They are pretty rich here. 5,001, to be precise, of the Nov 75s going up for a whopping 364. That's a meaty option. It might even be beefy. Could potentially even be called meefy. I don't know. We'll have to debate that in a little bit. This is through the offer, by the way, listeners. They were offered at 340. Clearly, there were not 5,000 offered at 340. <laughs> it looks like the offer is only good for about 170. So they said, yeah, we need more than that. We'll take all that you got all the way up to 364 to top out at 5,001. If you are curious, this is about a 43 vol. So pretty, pretty lofty, but it's no 2,000 vol either. The earnings are in this cycle, exactly a month from today, October 27th, is when we shall have the earnings bell. So that could explain why some of this juice, but still, this is a lot of juice here for an out-of-the-money call with just uh, just a couple of cycles to go here. Uh, Mr. Meatball, first off, what are your thoughts on these calls? B, do you think they qualify as Mefi? And in general, what are your thoughts on kind of just like an aggressive swing for the fences here in Dynatrace, sir? Yeah, you know, these are, they're a little bit uh, not in the money to be meefy, but there is a ton of juice in them and they're absolutely a swing to the fences. This is somebody clearly looking for a move. Uh, it's not like this one trades all the time. So this guy is 100% tipping his hand. Uh, I'd be looking for this thing to potentially get ahead of steam. So you're buying what this guy is buying. You think this thing's going to pop? I mean, I, did a bunch of stock go up with it? If not, then then it's it's just a straight up call by. And uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't, I, I, what I would say is I would probably sit back and see if this guy's right and then wait for him to do it again and jump on board. Yeah, it didn't go up tied. That doesn't mean anything, obviously. They could have still done stock against it, but we don't, it's, you have to dig a little bit to find it. And that is not something we've had the chance to do yet. So if you want to go look at the blocks of stock listeners to ferry it out for yourself. <laughs> We are more than welcome to do such digging. But in the early blush, this is a pretty aggressive and pretty beefy. Yeah, not quite meefy. It's on the cusp. It's on the border. It's getting there. It's got meat overtones to it. (laughs) All right. Let's keep on rolling, man. We've talked about a lot of crazy trades. We could probably do hours of just who made money, who lost money, which trades were good, which trades were crap. Uh, Let's get to some of that now. Let's go back now. Let's dial the Wayback Machine, not that far, about a month, to August 26th, where we were talking about one of our frequent offenders of late. This is Altimune Inc. Of course, you know, it's a biotech, so it's going to have a nice whipsaw chart. And this one did. A year ago, it was trading 12.30. By the way, ticker symbol Alt ALT, trading 15.30 right now. A year ago, it was trading exactly three bucks shy of that, 12.30. Got all the way up to 24.61 back in February of this year. Ever since then, it's kind of been just a topsy-turvy roller coaster, getting as low as 780 as well. So, man, this thing's had quite the ride. And again, it's a biotech. It's kind of in the name. You expect a chart like this. If you didn't, you'd be disappointed. At the time, back on August 26th, what did we profile? We profiled a 10,000 lot of the SEPT 20s going up for almost 25 cents, 24.8 cents. Obviously, they had to do maybe a little bit of a sweep there to get all those options done if you were curious this is pretty juicy vol this is about a 121 volatility out there and i said these went up on the 26th the stock at the time was 13 dollars and 79 cents so at the time you said you know these are these are these are quite the reach the market was crazy too it was 15 cents at 50 it was a weird one because we couldn't really intuit what the hell was going on, just given the nonsense of that market. Also, the market, these options went up late, so that didn't help either. A lot of things gumming up the works. But we kind of looked, it looked like they got these, they bought these for a quarter. Probably hard to sell these for nearly a quarter at that point. 
And so let's see, how did the stock do over that period? Let's see, it sold off right away. So these weren't looking pretty good. Looks like the it hit its nadir over the last month on a couple of days after this trade on the 30th. It hit about 14 bucks. So this trade wasn't, well, it was 13.79 obviously before that. So it had rallied a little bit. Let me expand this out to exactly the day we were talking about here. There we go, August 26th. So yeah, that closed that day after trading. Stock was 13.79 when the trade went up. It closed that day at 14.28. Rallied a bit, then sold back off again to about 14 bucks. And then again, that was the low. This thing took off, but it didn't get to the 20 handle. Got up to about, oh, about almost 17, 1681 on the 10th of September, about a week before expiration. And Mr. Meatball, you know, we've seen many times where, you know, this obviously needed a big pop for these things to really work out. They got a pretty decent pop. I mean, the stock rallied over three bucks or close to three bucks, really depends on where you're looking here. And so they had a chance maybe to get out of these bad boys. And oftentimes we say to people, hey, you know, you, you got to get while the getting's good. Looks like this person did exactly that. They got out on the 8th. So they came in a few weeks later when these things were trading a buck 30. So they paid about 25 cents for them. And they got out for a buck 30. They made a buck 05. So they made a little over a million bucks, listeners. <laughs> Not a bad do, all things considered out there, Mr. Meatball. What are your thoughts here? Pocketing a million bucks here. On some pretty outlandish alt immune calls, sir. You know, four to one return on risk ain't so bad. Uh, paying a quarter and selling them at a buck and a quarter, a uh, buck 30. That's a, that's a nice trade. And uh, props to this guy for taking his money when it was there. Uh, that's an important step that a lot of people fail to do. Uh, so, yeah, now the, the key here, folks, you just heard me say, is uh, keep an eye out for this guy. And if he goes in, he or she goes in again, uh, you're going to want to be a part of that because this is somebody who clearly has a good track record of trading Altimune, has which Altimune, I didn't know was a thing, but it is. I was just going to ask you, has it been on your Gamdar? It sounds like it's not. It, not yet, but uh, I may have to add that in. There's a bunch of random names joining the Gamdar. How do you like the Gamdar, uh, by the way? You like that name, Gamdar? I don't, but I'm going with it because it's your show, Phil. Um, and That's why I say it, because I, I can just tell it, it rubs you the wrong way. So I'm I'm all about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's this. That is one that I think is is uh, you know again a customer that was right. Start uh, paying attention. Interesting stuff. Keep an eye on it for the Gamdar, which I can't take credit for. I do believe that was one of our listeners who coined that, even though I'm I am blanking on the name right now. So keep on rolling. Let's go out to another one. Uh, this is Beek, ticker symbol B-E-K-E. -E. This is actually K-E -E Holdings. This is an ADR out of China. And back a few days before our last trade, August 23rd, we profiled what can only be described as the mother of all line in the sand puts. Someone really, really wanted to draw the line in the sand here in good old K-E -E Holdings. Because, man, this thing, they did, they did, some, they did some paper. <laughs> At the time, we profiled what caught our eye was 124,784 of the SEP 10 puts that went up for 22 cents right off the bid. That's still 148 volatility. The stock at the time was 16 and a quarter. So these were six and a quarter out of the money. And let's see. There, yeah, are there earnings? There were no earnings in this cycle. It was pretty much just a straight up. Line in the sand, getting some juice, six and a quarter dollars out of the money here. And then, but that wasn't the whole story. That's what our eye of Soron first picked up on. But then we have it go back when we see stuff things, say, see what else you could find. And it found a bunch of other smaller lots, 2000 for 30 cents, 2963 also for 30 cents, 7082 for 30 cents. A lot went up for 30 cents. So total of 145,000 of these things traded on the day here. So this was sizable by any definition this is an enormous line in the sand on the 10 strike here listener someone's saying you know what i'm working this and if it gets below that i'm buying all the shares to the tune of oh 14.5 million shares <laughs> they're gonna put on at that level so this this was a sizable line in the sand listeners and i said the, the stock was at 16 and a quarter when these went up and let's see, it went out on expiration. You know, how weird is that? It went out on expiration, the exact same price, <laughs> 16 and a quarter. So it did a whole lot of nothing, listeners, in between 
that time. Obviously, it did move. Let's look at the past month. It's had a range of got up to, let's see, it topped out on the 7th at $22. So a long way away from that strike price. And then it sold off uh, to about fifteen sixty four, but that was after expiration. So during the cycle, it hit about 16 and a quarter. That was pretty much the low. So that's where it went out. So a weird saga for these puts, an enormous, enormous line in the sand. If you just look at the amount of profit they made on these bad boys, it's around three million bucks. You might say to yourself, well, that's that's pretty good. I would take that. But remember, they sold a bunch of puts, so they got to put aside the capital. Fourteen and a half million shares at ten bucks. <laughs> Talking 145 million bucks. So a lot of capital to put aside. Even if you do it, let's say on 50 percent margin, talking 72 and a half million dollars on this bad boy so you talk again you can break it down a number of different ways return on overall capital return on margin you have to put down it's going to be somewhere around two to four percent depending on how you break that down so it's up to you whether you think that's a a reasonable use of capital at the end of the day the short puts they're not a free lunch you have to tie up some money especially if you're doing it for this amount of size uh so intriguing stuff mr meatball an enormous one of the biggest we've ever seen line in the sand puts here it worked out but also obviously you got to tie up some capital to do this what are your thoughts on this overall trade sir yeah, I mean, it was definitely uh, a pretty big trade, a uh, pretty big line in the sand. Uh, I think it's, I mean, that's a sign that, uh, you know, that's where the big money thinks that uh, that this thing ain't, ain't going below that. So take note, folks, that and keep an eye on this one. Is another one that you want to follow along with if the customer is right. Yeah, clearly they were fading the Chinese sell-off. You know, they said this far, but no farther. They're not going to push this one to zero unlike maybe some of the other names that they've been cranking down on. So far, at least for the lifespan of these options, that bad boy worked out. As we keep on rolling, you know what else usually works out, listeners? It's the strategy block. So let's get to it. It's time to dispense options wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right, listeners, it's Monday. It's time to unleash Uncle Mike for him to pontificate at length on the psychological similarities between JYD and Dennis Rodman. Have at it. No, of course, I'm joking. He's going to talk today about all things covered call. And, you know, sell a covered call. People always panic. People panic regardless of what happens in covered calls. They panic if the stock rallies to their strike and then goes through it. They say, oh, my God, I blew through my strike. They also panic if it goes the other way. The stock sells off. So, Mr. Uncle Mike, in such a scenario, when the stock is selling off and I've sold a covered call and now I'm panicking, what should I do, sir? <laughs> well, like we always ta- say when we, we leave the office to go to lunch, if any of my clients call, tell them there's plenty of reason to panic and hang up quickly. So um, I had a futures broker that I worked with over 10 years ago. One time he told me, if you're a broker, you're a commission-based broker, the best thing that you can do if you want to stay in business is covered calls. I said, oh, well, why is that? He said, because no matter what happens, you're always right as a broker. If the stock goes higher, well, hey, we're making money, Mr. Client. If the stock stays the same, oh, you're making money because of time decay. If the stock goes down, oh, well, thank God you sold those covered calls. We were smart for doing that. At least we're not losing that much. We at least get something out of it. And so with that, um, I think that just goes to show that the covered call can actually be one of the most mentally taxing trades in existence, quite honestly. The fact that you can twist it and think about it in pretty much any way with which you want to either make it good or to make it bad. Now, what I want to go through this through today is what do you do? Not just how do you mentally react to something, because uh, that's a topic for another strategy block. But what do you do when the stock just goes down on you and you have this covered call? Well, first off, if you're a broker, I guess you call your clients and say, thank God I was smart enough to sell those calls. Just kidding. The first thing you need to do is just have a, have a plan before you even get into the trade. At what point are you wrong on the stock? And so at RCM, where we have our triple income strategy, uh, oftentimes we'll do call spreads, but we do covered calls at, at, at times as well. Today, I just want to address what we'll do with covered calls. We don't get out of the stock until there's something fundamentally wrong with it in that strategy. Now, there's other strategies that we have that will get out based on technicals, based on events, things like that. But until there's something fundamentally wrong with the stock, we stay in it. And so with that, that can be kind of challenging 
in that, let's say that the stock's going down because of a bear market, uh, because of uh, COVID or whatever, and you basically have a Band-Aid on a severed jugular. And what I mean by that is if the stock goes down $8 and you got a dollar in premium for your covered call that you sold, that really doesn't make you feel that much better. Kind of like a Band-Aid on a severed jugular would do to you. So what we try and do is number one, no matter what, as soon as we can make 80% of the profit of the premium that we collect on the covered call, we're out. So if we sold a, a call for a dollar and it's at 20 cents, we get out no matter what when the stock starts going down. Now, where that can get kind of tricky is if volatility is going higher, the price of the call really doesn't move that much and the stock is going down, which that happens at times. But we still just put in our limit order. At some point in time, Vega takes over and does its job. And I'm sorry, Theta takes over Vega, and eventually it will get to that level at some point. So we usually just set a standing limit order at 20 cents if it was a $1 covered call that we sold. And so the question becomes, do you sell another call at a lower strike price? Well, sometimes you do, but you try not to do that so it's that quick. So in other words, if the stock's going down fairly slowly, then yeah, we would. So let's say that we sold a 55 call and the stock went from 53 to 51. Then yeah, we might sell a 54 call after that. And we might get the same premium. We might get a little bit more. Who knows? It just all depends on the timing of it. But if it's going down slowly, we can sell calls on the way down if it's going down slow enough for us to do that. Now, the next question is, well, what if it hemorrhages and just goes down really quickly and there's no fundamental problem with the stock and you still want to own the stock? Well, that's when we make the decision. We can go one of two ways with it. The first way is that we can just make this a hold stock for the time being until it rallies back. And if it takes a year, two years, three years, we're fine with that. But we don't want to sell any calls because of the fact that we believe it'll come back and it's kind of taken on a different life within the portfolio. Now, the second thing that we can do is if we still want to sell some premium against it, we can sell call spreads against it. We did this with uh, Apple during COVID, and that Apple just got punished really badly during COVID. And so instead of selling covered calls when it was down so much, because there was nothing fundamentally wrong with Apple, and quite honestly, we really liked it as a buy. If we wouldn't have had a lot of it in the other portfolios, we probably would have bought more of it. But we liked it just for a lot of reasons, and that even during a global pandemic, people are still going to want iPads and iPhones and things like that. So we didn't want to get rid of the stock. But what we did was we sold call spreads against it. So instead of selling a covered call, we would sell the covered call and then buy another call on top of it. So that way, in case it rallies back fiercely, like Apple did, then we wouldn't miss out on it. So ultimately, I think there's three thoughts for what to do if the stock is going against you on a covered call. The first one is, is just get out if you don't like the stock anymore for technical or fundamental reasons. Um, and make sure if you are going to go that route that you have the plan in place before you even get into the trade. Uh, the other thing with which you could do is you could sell more calls on the way down. Uh, the other thing that you could do if it's going down a little too fast for you is you could sell a call spread if you still wanted to collect premium. And then the fourth thing you can do, sorry, there were four, not three. You can just hold the stock for a while. And that is what we do when we have stocks go against us which will happen to anybody in our triple income portfolio. There we go. As we keep on rolling, it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, buddy. Welcome to Around the Block. Tell you what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this week. Also. Let's pay off really quickly. Some of our questions of the week here. Last week, we asked you, you know, VIX was popping this time a week ago. I know it seems like a distant memory now, but this time a week ago, we were selling off hard and VIX was popping hard. And so we asked you, VIX is popping, markets firmly in the red to kick off the week. Was this a blip or did this have some teeth? Quite simply, where was VIX going to close at the end of the week? We gave you those four ranges. Very elevated, so north of 26. Elevated, which was 23 to about 26. Frothy, so about 20 to 23. And bubbling, which is below 20. And weirdly enough, I thought bubbling would have a resurgence towards the end of the week because obviously VIX was selling off. And that's where we were heading towards the end of the week. 
But actually, <laughs> it was Frothy that got a bit of a resurgence there on Friday, which is kind of weird. Obviously, we closed shy of the 18 handle, so bubbling was the right answer. But we did see a, a, an uptick in people voting in the 20 to 23 range towards the end of the poll. Like people expected a pop in VIX right at the end of the day on Friday, which was interesting. So what ended up happening, weirdly enough, was an exact tie. We hardly ever see this. An exact tie, 30% each for bubbling, so below 20, which turned out to be the right answer. And then Frothy at the 20 to 23 range, both at exactly 30%, which is strange, not 30.01, anything like that. And then we had 24.3% for very elevated. Obviously, some of those were the early blush voting when we were hanging out in that range. And only no love the entire week for 23 to 26. Like everyone thought it was going to stay really high or just kind of get annihilated down below 23. There was no love for the 23 to 26 range the whole week. That only ended up at about 15.7%. So you are an interesting bunch. A savvy bunch. Let's see what you have on the brain this week. This week, we're asking, like I said, at the top of the show, straddles, a bit of a mixed bag. They have a bit of a mixed reputation out there. Some folks love them. Other folks, not so much. What do you guys think? Do you guys love straddles or hate them? Quite simply, do you trade them? And so we gave you two choices with our third, our patented curveball that we like to throw in there as well to make things interesting. Uh, we asked you, hey, do you guys love straddles? You like to trade them? No, you don't love them. Or you prefer... Some other spreads with wings that could incorporate a straddle, like an iron fly, or some straddle-like functionality, like a condor or a butterfly out there. And so far, right now, it's actually a tie. In the early boating, it's only been live less than an hour. We have uh, 40% each for yes, I love straddles, and also 40% for I prefer fly slash condors. Only 20% says no, I hate them. So interesting. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting voting afoot out there. Let's go back out now around the horn. Let's go out to the greasiest of meatballs dare i say it the most rodman like at least personality wise again i want that gift listeners of him in the rodman wedding dress in north korea if you can make that happen you will make my day mr meatball a what are your thoughts on our straddle poll do you love them do you hate them or you prefer flies or condors or iron flies and then b what do you keep an eye on for the rest of this week you know straddles can work if you if you trade them right i'm not anti straddle uh obviously a lot of times i'm doing uh, flies around things because they're just a lot more margin efficient. But um, no, I'm not anti straddle. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not anti anything. Uh, I don't love iron condors. Outside of iron condors, I'm not anti anything. How'd you ever fall in with Jared then, Mister Iron Condor, back in the day? Because uh, I like him. You know, <laughs> he just because he's wrong doesn't mean he's not. Like him. <laughs> uh, what do you keep an eye on for the rest of the week, sir? Uh, you know, I want to see whether um, this rebalance continues. I want to see what happens with the NASDAQ over the next couple of days. And uh, I want to see if the VIX is going to make a run at 16, uh, especially if we get some sort of deal, because that will be in the cards. Indeed. Mr. Uncle Mike, same question for you. What are your overall thoughts on straddles? Love them, hate them, or you prefer perhaps flies or condors? And then B, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of the week, sir? Sorry about that. Mute button issues. Um, I typically, I can't even tell you the last time I did a straddle, uh, I'm in a butterfly right now, but it's a bullish butterfly. Uh, so I'm not against them. I mean, I'm not against real estate investing either. Just not something that I do. Uh, so I guess it's just something that's just a different game for me. Uh, in terms of what I'm keeping an eye on this, the rest of this week, just wanting to see if, uh, it's a, it's a deal or no deal type of week. So, uh, we'll call it a Howie Mandel type of week, I guess. So we'll see what happens. But ultimately, I think that we will get a deal. But we'll see. I could be wrong. All right, listeners. That music means we have to leave that there for the first episode of the Option Block this week. But as you know, this just is the tip of the meaty options iceberg that we have in store for you throughout the rest of the week. Crypto Rundown coming up in about exactly an hour. We'll be joined by the folks from Kraken there. So we're going to have to rejigger the live a little bit for our live guests coming up in about an hour. So we're going to... Stop the live stream to come back for a crypto rundown in about an hour. So if you're listening live in the secret club, go get a beverage, have a break, hit the old pate, and then we'll be back in exactly an hour to talk about all that. Of course, tomorrow, great pro Q&A coming up with the chief strategist over there at IB. So get your questions in now for that Wednesday, of course, your double dose of education. Also got the rear appearance of the advisors option. We'll get to talk to the Oracle of New Hampshire, see what's cooking over there. Got a great guest for that one as well. And then, of course, we're back on Thursday for episode due of the old option block. But before we do that, let's go back around the horn. Mr. Uncle Mike, we'll start with you. 
If folks want to contact you, maybe follow you on Twitter to debate JYD's theme songs or anything else, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Well, by all means, follow me on Twitter at Mike Tusa, T-O-S-A-W. I will have another unique post this week. I'll have a market update, but uh, not going to tell you where it's going to be. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So follow me on Twitter because if you don't follow me, you ain't going to see it. Uh, And if you're interested in working with a financial advisor who delves in the option product from time to time, and by delve, I mean stare at it constantly every day, if it's appropriate for the client, of course, feel free to reach out to me, uh, stcharleswealth.com. And Mr. Meatball, sir, same question for you. If folks are intrigued, they want to reach out to you to discuss and maybe create some gifts of you as Dennis Robin in a, in a wedding dress. Uh, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, make sure you're heading to options.com every day. I write a VIX blog and uh, a market blog all, uh, every day. It's something you should be reading and checking out. Today, I discuss the misery that is UVXY. Uh, so go to option.com, check us out. You can follow me on Twitter at option pit. Uh, I follow Mark and Mike because they provide good information. Uh, and they follow me back because, uh, I'm always putting out the best in options content. Speaking that of the best podcast, Mr. Meatball, look, asking you shall receive. I got an early Christmas gift for you. Cause I know you wanted this. I just was informed by our producer. We will be joined on Friday by your Mr. Carson there. From uh, oh, nice. Aegea Capital Management on Volatility Views. Are you excited? Are you a little bit giddy, sir? Jem is a great guy, and that'll be a lot of fun to do. To do. He's a smart trader, knows his stuff. Uh, should be a lot of fun. We'll have lots of VIX to talk about. All right, so stay tuned for that on Friday, Volatility Views. Meanwhile, we'll be back later today for a crypto rundown and all the rest of the great content, and then back again on Thursday, another episode of The Option Block. We'll see you then. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>